This episode, I'm joined by Lance Strait, who is an American writer and professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University. He is the author of Amazing Ourselves to Death, Neil Postman's Brave New World Revisited, alongside various other texts on media ecology. In this episode, we discuss Neil Postman's text, Amusing Ourselves to Death. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you would like to support the podcast and keep it going indefinitely, please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. So, Lance Strait, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Glad to be here. Uh, We are going to be discussing uh, the work of Neil Postman, largely revolving around his book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, which is probably his most, well, is his most popular and most well-known book. Um, This is an episode which many people have asked for. Uh, There seems to be not too many people out there who really are all that aware of Postman anymore, or at least within that sort of sphere of thought McLuhan sort of seems to always come out on top and other thinkers there are uh, often thrown to the side it seems but um, before we begin with Postman um, Lance just tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is you do and, and how you know it might be a while ago now but how you first came across the work of Neil Postman. Right well I'm a professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University and I was one of Neil Postman's students when I entered the doctoral program uh, at New York University, sadly uh, no longer in existence, but it was the media ecology program. Uh, I don't know exactly when I first came across Postman's work because I, looking back long ago at my undergraduate career, I uh, did take a course in an, uh, on education and on the syllabus was uh, his co-authored book, Teaching as a Subversive Activity, which before amusing ourselves to death was his big, uh, yeah, most popular and best known book. And he was a uh, leader of the uh, educational reform movement that was associated with the counterculture of the 60s and 70s. I was an undergraduate and uh pursued my master's during the 70s, uh, during the late 70s. But uh, I know it was during my uh, time as a master's uh, student at Queens College, part of the City University of New York, that I was assigned his book, Teaching as a Conserving Activity, which was one of uh, what he sometimes referred to as his television trilogy, followed by the disappearance of childhood and then by amusing ourselves to death. But uh, at the same time, I went to work as a teaching assistant and came into contact with other folks working at Queens College um, in the multimedia unit. uh, And they were studying with Neil Postman in the media ecology program. So when I came in and they said, well, what are you interested in? And I said, well, I'm interested in Marshall McLuhan and Jacques Ellul uh, was another one, Daniel Borston, uh, and others of that sort, uh, media and technology uh, critics and theorists. And this, they said, hey, you should uh, go on for your doctorate. And I was like, go on for my doctorate? I, and I, why would I do that? I never even thought about it. But, you know, it was like the 60s and 70s, there was a sense of... Uh, you know, go with the flow. So uh, they they recommended me to Postman and his colleagues, and they and um, told me to go apply for the doctoral program. So I did uh, in as I was completing my master's, um, and uh, they accepted me on the spot based on my interests. So that was the first time I met Neil. Uh, And I got to know him very well during my time uh, in the program. And I was lucky enough, things were calm enough in in those days that I spent many years just hanging out. I also took a long time to complete my dissertation, uh, which is not, uh, I'm not the first one to have done that. But I spent many years hanging out and getting to know Neil quite well. Um, So I feel very privileged to have been in that position. What, what was uh, he like as a person? Uh, well, um, one of the things I can say is that 
He was uh, very charming, very good natured, loved to kid around. Um, in some ways, you know, almost ironically, given amusing ourselves to death being the topic, is that he was a very amusing person himself. And uh, he loved, uh, in terms of teaching, and he took great pride in teaching because his uh, original field was education. And he felt that he was most successful when he could generate a good discussion among his students. And uh, But then when uh, class was over, it was very hard to get him to actually talk about serious subjects. You know, he always wanted to talk about you know anything else, just to have fun. Um, one of the things he really excelled at was asking questions. Um, he would just ask people questions. Uh, and he was the kind of person he loved to talk to people. In fact, uh, uh, it, I, I often felt I'm not that, it may sound like I can talk a lot uh, the way I'm talking now, but I'm not that much of a talker. So I, I often felt it was uh, what I needed to do was to find other people for him to talk to, that that would be my my job. Do you talk to anybody? And, you know, that was the thing is that he had no pretensions. He answered his own phone. You know, he didn't have like a you know secretary screening calls for him. And it didn't matter. It could be, you know, um, you know, it could be the president of the United States, um, and, and he did um, spend some time uh, with Bill Clinton, or it could be the janitor cleaning up, you know, in the office. It didn't, or the taxi driver. It didn't matter. He just loved people, and he loved to talk to people. Um, I'll say one other thing. He was a jock, um, and, you know, that's a certain kind of person. Um, so he was a actually a basketball star as an undergraduate for his college team and even played a, 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 a brief, had a brief stint in minor league baseball. Uh, apparently he couldn't hit the curveball. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Would you agree with what I said there about him being somewhat forgotten in relation to say, you mentioned McLuhan and, uh, and Alul. I mean, I've done a couple of episodes on Alul and he's somewhat um, overshadowed. I mean, people mostly focus on his, just, just on his propaganda and technological society, even though he's written however yeah. many other books um but do, do you feel postman's sort of been forgotten a little bit in maybe not so much in media ecology but generally speaking well you know it's always hard to gauge these things you know what what i can see say what i can say is that when trump was running uh <laughs> you know gained the republican nomination and then became president um, I suddenly saw Postman being referenced an enormous number of times in the, you know, in news and opinion pieces. So uh, if he was kind of forgotten, then, you know, we do tend to, um, you know, when people pass away, they tend to fade from memory as far as public discourse is concerned. So uh, perhaps so, but both Postman and McLuhan were referenced um, a great deal uh over the past five years, I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, okay, before we jump in with amusing ourselves to death and Postman's actual theories, I have to ask you the hermetic, hermetics question. Uh, you can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listen in on the conversation. Uh, who do you pick? But as we're talking about Neil Postman specifically, we he's already in there and you can put in three more. Well, that would be uh, quite quite an interesting combination. Uh, yeah, I'm tempted to put McLuhan in there, and I know that they did interact uh, on a number of occasions. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, Postman had an anecdote about how he and uh, Charlie Weingartner, who was his, uh, uh, Weingartner was Postman's classmate when they were doing their doctorate, and then his co-author for several books, but how they shared a room with McLuhan um, the thing about it was that, as he explained it, McLuhan was basically just talking and talking, and they were listening, and he continued on even as they drifted off into, into sleep. Um, so I'm not sure what that conversation would actually sound like. And, and while Jacques Ellul would be interesting, they wouldn't understand each other because Ellul only spoke French. Um, I would put Hannah Arendt in that room because I would like to see uh, some of that interaction uh however and uh i guess at this point maybe daniel borston they did have a chance to interact on a number of occasions which i kind of was was the catalyst for uh in terms of uh, we had a 
conference session on Borston's book, The Image, which in many ways is part of the foundation of amusing ourselves to death and, and uh, also worth reading and going back to. Um, so I think that might be an interesting triad uh, for some conversation. Okay, so McLuhan, Arendt, and Borston. Um, where do you yeah. think where do you think that conversation might lead to? I mean, McLuhan's probably going to take the main stage, but well, it would no. But I was saying Postman, Arendt, and, and oh, Borston, okay, okay, right. So I think they would they would focus on politics and the future of the American Republic, and and Borston, uh, you know, Postman was a classic New York liberal. Uh, and he, was, he would say that at one one time, just one time, he considered voting for a Republican and he reached out in the voting booth with his hand and he couldn't bring himself to do it. Uh, and, and as a New Yorker myself, I know exactly that that sense, you know, that um, so and Postman, um, he, he actually had his differences with the left uh, and he was briefly on the Ed Board of the Nation and left over some disagreements. So he didn't go to the extremes of uh, some folks on the progressive move in the progressive movement, but he was firmly in the kind of liberal Democrat, you know, in the U.S. you know Democratic Party kind of of camp. Um, Borston, on the other hand, was a Republican and uh, more of a conservative, um, although in, in the sense of, I mean, he was appointed by Gerald Ford, for example, as uh, I think it was as the uh, chief librarian of a librarian of Congress, which is sort of like the the top scholarly position, you know, in the United States, sort of like the equivalent of the poet laureate. Um, <laughs> But, um, you know, so and Borston was, you know, and I think they both had a common ground in being uh, in still having faith in the American ideals, um, however much we don't live up to it, but that those ideals and the Enlightenment was a good thing, an important thing and something not that should not be abandoned. Um, and then Hannah Arendt, of course, also, and while she is generally categorized as a philosopher, she considered herself to be a political scholar, a political theorist. Um, so, and I think they would have so much to say about this present moment where, you know, here in the United States, we just came through what seems to be a kind of flirtation with, with a drift to authoritarianism, with a strong stream that that previously was suppressed, repressed, you know, kind of come coming out uh, in, in significant ways. I would like to hear what they have to say about that. And of course, in relation to media, you know, how our current media environment is wrapped up in all that's going on today. Yeah, I mean, may, maybe you disagree with me in here, but I'd certainly be interested to hear that conversation see what they made of the 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 post trump media landscape in the sense of what has happened to the media around trump since since he uh, is no longer president he seemed to seem mm -hmm. to be a blitzkrieg of trump anything as if this sex four year section of history has been erased i don't know if you'd agree with me there but it's a peculiar instance well, yeah, again, I'm, I agree with you. I'd like to hear what they think about about all of this. Uh, they, there was, I think that they're kind of like waking up from a bad hangover. Um, but, you know, certainly, you know, Postman's view and is that they want this, you know, that that, um, you know, the problem is that inherent in the kinds of electronic media that we have is the desire to attract audiences and gain attention and not to communicate rationally. So whether it's for or against, they want the high drama and it's very hard for them to shake that off, especially when they see their audiences dwindling. Uh, and, and Borston, I think, would agree because he was writing about how the mediated kind of content that that is prepared especially for for the media and 
is so much easier than for the press and for television to report on. It's it's like handing it to them and saying, it's like if I did your podcast, right? If I just recorded everything ahead of time and said, here, and <laughs> you know, in one sense, you might say, well, this is great. I don't have to do any work, right? And, and that is what people, you know, who are trying to manipulate the media have come to understand, you know, that that's how you go about it. Um, you know, and, and by the way, I mean, Borston, you know, since we're just on the topic, I mean, it, it really interests me because part of what he wrote about was how Senator Joseph McCarthy was so good at manipulating the press and creating, and Borston coined the term, pseudo events. And then here we, here we are, right? McCarthy was assisted by Richard Nixon, uh, you know, as a young politician, and Roy Cohn, the lawyer. Right. And Roy Cohn was Trump's mentor. Many of the people in Trump's circle were, you know, the older ones were smarting over Nixon's uh, resignation. I, you know, I mean, there is this straight line that can be painted and traced between Joseph McCarthy and Donald Trump. And, and I think that is something that, you know, we need to to understand. Um of course, Hannah Arendt was all about, you know, understanding totalitarianism and, and, uh, and uh, you know, again, I think, you know, Postman was able to synthesize all of these ideas, you know, including one, ones from McLuhan, and put it into a very biting critique of American culture. And he warned about, you know, that we, the potential here is culture death. Um, and, you know, it's, it remains an open question whether we are going through a kind of death throes at this point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's an interesting question. We've got the, the multiple sort of cornerstones of, of Postman. We've got the schooling, well, education, entertainment, uh, techno uh, technology, or revering technology. But do you think there is a, you know, it's a, I'm sure it's an extremely difficult question, but do you think there is a way to, there is a, a guiding thing for Postman, which which did connect them all in that sense. Do you think it is related to that death of culture? Well, uh, I, I the guiding thing, I, the way I see it, I've I've written, of course, about Postman, and uh, one I refer to him as the defender of the word. Um, that he was somebody who loved language um, and was very much dedicated to language. And, and that really was his early uh, emphasis, because he came out of not just education, but English education, and out of a period where they're trying to say what English teachers should be doing, you know, in, in uh, secondary school. Um, he actually wrote a series of textbooks from eighth to twelfth grade. You know. uh, but what they should be doing is not teaching proper grammar and, you know, spelling and that sort of thing. They should be teaching about how symbols work, mm -hmm. um, you know, metaphor, you know, in, in its fullest sense. Uh, and Postman was very much guided by the uh, Cambridge crowd, in, uh, the early 20th century, I.A. Richards, um, uh, chief among them. And, you know, with it, the, you know, really looking at how meaning is produced, how we as human beings make meaning. Um, and he was also connected to general semantics. He worked for a year at San Francisco State with S.I. Hayakawa, um, who was the, the best known proponent of general semantics, which is all about thinking critical about our language and perceptions and taking control of our own evaluations and responses so that we're not just giving into knee-jerk reactions. So, you know, and that feeds into as well the study of propaganda. So, I mean, these are all uh, parts of his concerns. If you look at the subtitle of Amusing Ourselves to Death, there's a key term there because it's public discourse in the age of show business, it's discourse, right, which is language. You know, that, and, and then he always came back to that. He always came back to how we use language and how we misuse language. He had a great phrase that he introduced back earlier on 
um, because, you know, I, I.A. Richards co-authored a book with C.K. Ogden called The Meaning of Meaning hmm. back in 1923. And then, then, you know, and this is guiding it. And so he, Postman talked about the demeaning of meaning, that we demean meaning by misusing symbols and emptying them of their meaning. And, um, uh, so he's very much guided by George Orwell. Um, as well, although he didn't agree with everything Orwell had to say. But, uh, you know, I mean, all of that, that kind of approach um, was very central to him. And so in the face of our long history of language, um, and it's the combination of speech and writing, and together printing uh, the book, the printed book, the essay, as the basis of enlightenment, you know, that all of that brings us to the enlightenment and modern science, the found, you know, modern democracy, all of that. And then along comes the image, you know, our ability to produce visual images. And that's was a really key ta target for him, you know, as far as trying to understand what's gone wrong here. And it's the more that we relied on images and paid attention to images instead of language, the more we moved away from rational thought and into uh, irrational emotional reactions. And it's not that you want to be, you know, um, completely unemotional. You know, you have to have a heart, but it's like when you lose your head um, and that that is what image culture does. And like McLuhan and Postman was responding to the introduction of television in their lifetimes. And unlike McLuhan, Postman emphasized that we watch television, that it is a visual medium, and that that is a key part of the problem. Right? So again, it's word versus image. And Postman was defending the word um, against the image. And he was very very much enamored when Jacques Ellul came out with a book called The Humiliation of the Word, because that kind of fit it as well. So it seems there that his work's taken the trajectory of tackling aspects of society and culture which are basically hampering our understanding and not allowing us, uh, you know, television just is an apathetic medium where you don't really have to engage in it in any sense. You could basically almost be in a coma with your eyes open and still watch TV, um, you know, alongside his the reverence of technology, which then hampers our understanding. So, was mm -hmm. was the word for Postman basically that way of entering into a far deeper understanding? Sure, I mean, language. The word is the basis of dialogue, and it's the basis of rational thought. Um, you know that he would go back to. I mean, others. You, you know. And this is actually something that I get into in my book, Amazing Ourselves to Death, Neil Postman's Brave New World Revisited, because, you know, Postman wrote for a popular audience, so he didn't get into the kind of theoretical context, but I provide some of that. Um, you know, so we go back to Bertrand Russell and Alfred North Whitehead and, and that whole effort to understand the nature of language and the ability to create propositions that can, are testable. Um, and that is, you know, uh, that's very central to what he's looking at because then when you get to images, they're not pr propositional. Uh, this also comes out in the work of, of the philosopher Suzanne Langer. And she talks about these things, but it's just, you, you look at a picture and you can't say whether it's true or false. It doesn't make an argument. There's no claim. Just think of a photograph or even a moving image. What does it do? What does it say? Only when you add words to it does it make any kind of argument or express an opinion or make a statement. Um, so the more, again, that we rely on images, I mean, what do they do? They evoke emotion out so that the more that we rely on images, the farther away, the more we reduce our capacity for this kind of intelligent, rational thought that was so hard won. 
it was so hard to develop it. I mean, we spent centuries and centuries working on it. And we reached this wonderful moment, you know, as we got into the 19th century. And then it, I guess you could say in McLuhan's terms, terms, it flipped into its opposite as we hit the 20th century. So I'm, that's part of it. And uh, Postman was also you know, critical of the speed at which uh, electronic communications travels, uh, the immediacy, not giving us, because that, that undermines our ability to reflect uh, as well. We can't, uh, you know, it's just too much. One thing after another, after another, after another, all without context. I postman referred to television as the context of no context. Um, and so we don't have time to just sort of reflect and really make sense out of things. We just get fragments that we respond to emotionally. That's all we have. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, just, and, to- and, you know, just the, the, uh, the one other thing in terms of the technology side of it is that we just get the other thing that's affecting language is numbers. So we just get lots and lots of statistics and, uh, and they're used for polling, for example, and surveys. And, and we move further away again from the rationality of just talking about things because you can't argue with a statistic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, jumping back to something you brought in earlier, which Postman brings up right at the beginning of Amusing, um, which is that the difference and the sort of the dialogue between the Orwellian and the Huxleyan world. And I mean, this has sort of become a bit of a cliche in contemporary societal debate. You know, the Orwellian right. authoritarianism, totalitarianism, complete lockdown of even the language we use. And then the Huxleyan sort of almost self prison of absolute pleasure. Nothing matters because you've got pleasure on tap and i mean it's the question that's often asked but do do you where do you see us currently being in that in that debate or do you think there's now a need for a third position that's an interesting question uh you know huxley himself you know who wrote brave new world in the 30s and then when he read 1984 he he himself argued what Postman would later would argue that uh, that 1984 was a kind of special case, but that he believed that Brave New World was more in line with with where at least the West was headed. Uh, it is uh, it's so hard to make any kind of prediction about the future, though. I teach science fiction films, so, uh, you know, it's the whole history is history of of visions of the future that never came to pass. Um, So I don't know if we, you know, I suppose the potential is there for some kind of totalitarian setup that Orwell envisioned, but it seemed like there is so much energy involved in doing that and so much pressure in a way that that builds over time that uh, it's hard to imagine that really sticking for very long. But what we are seeing are kind, you know, is in some ways a mix, but it it really does lean toward the Huxleyan view, um, which, by the way, also included medication, you know, included drugs to keep people happy, um, which is very much a part of, of our culture as well. Um, But uh, when we look at the fact that, you know, again, you know, this recent experience with Trump, you know, being a reality television star and, you know, and we should make no, no, have no illusions about it. He he didn't make become president because he was a business, you know, leader or anything, you know, like that. um, He it it wasn't on any of that. It was because he was a reality TV star. That's that was the whole uh, reason that he became president. So in that regard, it, it is Huxley. It is the shallowness of entertainment rather than the pressure of coercion um, that Orwell was talking about. Where Orwell is important is in, especially in his appendix, is where he talks about 
manipulating language. Uh, and I think the postman would agree on, you know, on that score. Um, you know, he would, he would also say that um, Huxley's procedure, if you like, um, would be more effective, but the end result of just reducing language to a more limited, you know, to reducing vocabulary, reducing language to a kind of infantile state, um, basic quality, you know, that that is part of where we've been headed. And, and again, that goes back to the image kind of taking, undercutting linguistic ability. Mm -hmm. I mean, what what do you what do you think happens though? I mean, this this first question I sort of wrote out here, which is something I guess is sort of tackled by all these different media ecologists in different ways. But I mean, uh, media just becomes more and more fragmented, as you've sort of mentioned. It keeps accelerating to the point where I think most. I think there was a study a, a while ago where you know, don't quote me on this. I'm not going to be able to find it right now. But a study where people basically the majority of people admitted that they only really read the headline of something. So we're basically existing, existing right. in this world where we just like, it's a very quick, okay, we've seen that. And that is now the, the objective truth for me. And it seems that these snippets are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I mean, I don't think we could really get smaller than a tweet, but I mean, what, what effects do you think this is going to have, um, I guess from that postman perspective on the future of, of knowledge of understanding, of, of, I guess, respect for culture. Well, I, I, and I've referred to this as telegraphic discourse. <laughs> right? I mean, we really go back to the telegram where, where it was necessary to keep messages very short and leave out, uh, you know, words uh, <laughs> to shorten them as much as possible. Uh, and, and that's what Twitter gives us. But, uh, then, the, you know, there have been many uh, folks, uh, Nicholas Carr, for example, um, you know, following in Postman's line of thinking and saying, you know, one of the things that's lost is deep reading. And in fact, this is one of the most significant neurological uh, findings of the past couple of decades is, uh, on the one hand, that learning to read uh Becoming literate literally rewires your brain. It changes your brain structure and function. Uh, and Postman would certainly love those results because, and and would would say it's obviously in a good way, as as so many advocates of literacy and reading have pointed out. You know that it gives us all that we we so treasure about our our culture. And then that electronic media, television, and then our online media, our, our mobile devices, our screens, you know, that they undercut and short circuit that process and alter our brains in other ways, but in ways that are not so great. And so this is very concerning. Um, some point to the movie Idiocracy, where, you know, it's this feeling that we are kind of evolving into a stupider and stupider kind of, of society. Um, but certainly the loss of the ability to focus, to concentrate, and to go in depth on reading, uh, you know, even just an extended essay, and kind of quietly in a way, but major magazines all have shortened their, the length of their articles, knowing that people won't read them. And it's especially hard on, on mobile devices. So, uh, so this is very much a part of what's going on. But I think and another person who was you know, also interacting with Postman back in the day was Sherry Turkle. And she talks about the decline of conversation. And that's the other side of it, because it's not just about reading. But it's simply about being able to sit down and have an intelligent conversation uh, with someone else. And that, too, has been in decline. And it's very hard to when we're both looking at our phones and, and responding to the barrage of alerts. And it's very hard to just focus on each other, maintain eye contact, and have a, you know, a significant dialogue. So again, it's on both of those levels, both on the level of morality and literacy at the, you know, together, you know, that and post would say we achieved a wonderful balance between the two. 
uh, af- with the advent of printing um, and the availability of print media, because the first of all, there it, print is very legible compared to handwriting. So it is this great boon to reading. So we have this wonderful but delicate balance, and then we completely disrupted it, especially through television and the various media that have come after television. I mean, this is I was going to ask this when you mentioned it. The You teach science fiction films and you say it's tough to predict the future, but is there any that you, you do feel uh, we're heading into? And I mean, you've already mentioned idiocracy, so I'm assuming <laughs> that that might be the closest. Well, I, I, I'm not the... I, I've seen others make that kind of point and... and uh, yeah, and of course, there it, it is. It's actually a wonderful illustration of of Darwinian natural selection and the fact that evolution is not necessarily towards greater intelligence. It could be um, in the other direction. I, I like uh, uh, Kurt Vonnegut's novel, Galapagos, has us in the far future evolving into kind of uh, sea lion-like creatures because you know, he, he argues our big brains caused us nothing but trouble. Um, so it, it, it is really hard to see where we're going, because if you look at anything from the early 90s that looked at the future, they're always going to phone booths. In all of these movies, they have a futuristic phone booth that's like a computer with a video screen and all of that. No one, and that includes, uh, you know, the actual companies like AT&T, um, no one predicted that phone booths would just disappear. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it really is very difficult to to make that kind of, of, of prediction. And I just, I just don't want to because we're also facing the very real threat of climate change. And we have mm-hmm. no idea how that is going to, to work itself out. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and of course, our inability to respond to that has so much to do with the fact that we're constantly distracted online. Now, on the one hand, it has done a lot to, to when you think about online communication, I, it's great for awareness. It's great for spreading the word and people learn about things. But what we're finding is that the problem is that there's too much information there's too much distraction. There's too much confusion as a result. We all get information overload and nobody knows what to do. At the very moment that we're talking, uh, we are moving here in the U.S. In, from a moment, a brief moment of semi-clarity about the pandemic back into a moment of confusion because we're getting conflicting uh, accounts from various authorities and other sources about about what's safe and what's not, and should we be wearing masks again or not, and and should we worry about these variants now or not? And we don't know, we don't have good filters or good um, uh, good ways of just making sense out of all this information. And that, that comes back to that point of evaluation. It's, uh, you know, Postman's argument was not, you know, that, that information isn't the problem. It was the problem centuries ago, people not having enough information. It was even a problem in the 19th century, but we solved the problem, right? I mean, we're like, you know, it's like, it's just like long, a long time ago, the big problem for our species was making sure that people had enough to eat, Mm -hmm. right? We're always, you know, we're hunting and gathering, or even, you know, once we get to the agricultural revolution, but that is the main focus, is just making sure there's enough to eat, and that something happened to us, um, you know, a century ago or so, where we figured out, at least in the, in the western part of the world, how to grow and, and make more than enough food to eat, but we just didn't stop, you know, we, we didn't stop with, you know, the idea of not making sure you have enough to eat. And so obesity now is a problem because we don't know when to stop. We don't know when to say enough. And that's the problem with information. And 
problem is no longer lack of information. The problem is our inability to make sense of it, to synthesize what we're taking in and come to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. So do do you think all screen sort of screen based televisual information is often primarily just an escape? Do you think there's any merit in that for for Postman? Well, it certainly is, uh, you know, again, an escape, a distraction. Um, and, and, that, and that infects all of, uh, you know, his argument is that you need to have serious discourse. And he never said there was no room for having fun. In fact, he said television is great for mindless entertainment. He watched TV. He wasn't like some of these other critics who didn't. In fact, he would even say sports on TV is great. Yeah, he would be watching the Olympics right now. And he loved watching baseball on TV, right? It's great for that. And and, um, it's great for just, you know, again, mindless entertainment. But then he's, you know, he also said, you know, you can watch TV and then, you know, like hours go by and suddenly you realize, you know, you've done nothing. Um, So it has that sort of mesmerizing quality. And we have the same experience, say, going through, uh, online media going through the stream and, and scrolling, scrolling, death scrolling, scrolling, um, and time just flitter, flitters and fritters by. Um, so I forgot your question. <laughs> uh, well, it, yeah. Is, is there any merit to, to oh. visual media for posting? Oh, well, oh, that was, oh, a, you, you that did, was... you did sort of answer that. Yeah. Yeah, and he never addressed the question of art either. I mean, he was not against art. Um, it just said that that's not his concern. It goes back to, you know, it's, it's Ecclesiastes. There's a time for frivol, fri- there's a time, to- <laughs> there's a time to have fun. There's a time, you know, to be frivolous and there's a time to be serious. And we've lost that distinction. So when you look at amusing ourselves to death, and, and I guess it, it's not explained in the book, but I bring that out in my follow-up of amazing ourselves to death, the four case studies that he does, news, politics, religion, and education are the four pillars of American democracy. You think about it, right? That politics is the obvious one, you know, it is democratic politics, which depend upon election campaigns and and governing. And when that is reduced to entertainment, and how do you have serious policy discussions and debates and so forth? News is a key element. The whole idea of democracy depends on the fact, you know, for people to say we can govern ourselves, right? The old, you know, this was King James, uh, he was the first to say you can't because before him, everyone took it for granted. But after printing was invented, he had to come out with an argument to say you can't govern yourself. You know, and he had this whole divine right of kings business that he came up with. But the older argument was just simply, how can you govern yourselves? You don't know anything. You don't know enough to make decisions. But with print media, we can. Uh, so that is a pillar of democracy, news and politics, often overlooked as religion. Um, but when we look again at the you know, development of American democracy, I mean, it is rooted in an under, religion as forming the basis of moral and ethical codes, and even just the idea of law itself. And is generated out of a religious sensibility that there are, you know, kind of natural rights, human rights. I uh, you know that religion gives us that that kind of foundation. Um, you know, the first real system of law is the Mosaic system from the book of uh, well, from Exodus, uh, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. Um, that you know that is our tradition. When we think about the, um, in, in a sense, what Western culture itself is built on. I and mean, we very typically think of ancient Greece, the alphabetic culture, you know, out of which, you know, philosophy and history and theater and, uh, and of course, democracy come from. But the other side of it is ancient Israel, which is also the, an alphabetic culture, the earlier 
uh, Semitic alphabet, and that is where law and an idea of history that goes along with it come from. So the religious element is also very important, you know, just not to say that, you know, you have to impose religious beliefs on anyone, but just to respect that tradition. Um, And when that is turned into entertainment, uh, and it, you know, it turns serious religion and serious ethical, moral questions into a joke. Um, And then lastly, education, that took a little longer, but public education, which Postman was a great champion of, was the guarantee of equality. You know, it said that, you know, you you may be poor and other people may be rich, but there is a kind of leveling that is carried out by giving everyone access to education um, and giving them that boost up. So, you know, to me, those are the, you know, and this is like, of course, the great American philosopher, John Dewey, is all about this. So those are the four pillars of American democracy. Each one is being undermined and cut away by the television and the media that followed. That reduction of these things, these sort of pillars to entertainment for Postman, was that being done consciously? Was there sort of an overarching reason for this? Almost, dare I say it, like some sort of agenda? Or was this just we sort of just gravitate because we we like being hedonistic. Well, neither, actually. I mean, his <laughs> argument, and, I, and I'm certainly in line with that, is that we you know, we nobody's thought about it. We just okay. He said, "Here's television." The people who introduced television, and you know, when commercial television started up right after World War II, and you look at what those people were saying it was like this is going to be a great boon we're going to bring culture to the masses we'll ha- you know they'll they'll be able to sit in, at home and watch ballet and and opera and they'll be able to attend political conventions and understand the workings of democracy so much better so when you look at what these people were saying they didn't have a clue not a clue of what the medium itself was about um, and and so as time goes on, it's the demands of the medium itself that rise to the fore. And there are ways to put, you know, kind of breaks on that if you consciously take control of it and say we're not going to do things. But especially under capitalism, you know, there's a tendency to try to let the, let the medium be the medium because that's going to make it most successful and make the most money. But even under other kinds of more authoritarian systems, they're still going to want to use it to its full potential. So everything slides toward, okay, what works best on the medium? Right? There's a, um, a term we use in media ecology, and, and it was part of Postman's vocabulary, but we trace it back to McLuhan and before him to Harold Innes. It's the bias of the medium. Mm -hmm. And by that, we don't mean bias in the sense of a political bias or or stereotypes or impartiality. We mean that the medium itself has certain tendencies. The way I explain it is that things tend to roll down a hill, not Mm -hmm. up a hill. It doesn't mean that you can't send something up a hill. It's just that the tendency is for things to roll down a hill. So in the same way, what's the tendency that television has? You know, the television has certain tendencies that are baked into its its technology, that it is a screen. So it wants to show you things. So if you just put a lot of printed words up on TV, you can do that. Right? You could take War and Peace and scroll it hmm. <laughs> You know, but nobody's going to watch that. And you can set up a single camera and show, say, the House of Representatives, you know, and you get like Mm C-SPAN. But very few people are going to want to see that because it doesn't look good on TV. You know, what looks good are people in close-up, actually. You know, two shots, um, you know, close-ups, not extreme close-ups because that gets sinister, you know, like in your face, but but, you know, sort of like shoulder up, 
kinds of shots you know that it's just the you know the way the medium works and what also works television is a broadcast medium so what works is, uh, is the sort of liveness things that are happening now have a special cachet on on tv and you can see something that's going on right now you know it's there's an excitement to that um you know it's why it's a uh, it doesn't matter if you don't know the outcome when you're watching a game that's already occurred. And I just, I just heard on the news this morning, people saying, you know, you know, don't listen if you don't want to know the outcome of the Olympics, you know, this morning, but, uh, but you know that it's already over with, right? Mm -hmm. There, it, 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 it's different. There's a different feeling to it because the bias of the medium is in the moment. It is present tense. You know, if you think about it, you read a book, you go to a movie, it's speaking to you in past tense, no matter what. It's mm -hmm. happened already. That's the bias of those media. Television, radio, it's speaking to you in present tense. Even if what you're seeing is pre-recorded, the medium itself speaks in the present tense. So television focuses on the present and makes us present-minded, um, mm -hmm. where... Before we thought more expansively in time, you know, we fo television focuses us on the immediate, the immediate, um, the now, and uh, so that is, you know, that's the basic, you know, sense so that Postman is coming at. Um, some people are not happy with that view because it seems to absolve others, the people in power, of blame. Mm -hmm. you know, by saying it's the medium. But the people in power are either passively accepting this so that they get the most benefit out of it, the most profit or benefit, and actively encouraging it for their own ends. Um, or once in a while, people in power may actually try to counter it in some way for the benefit of uh, others. So it doesn't absolve people in power, but it does help us to understand what's going on because, you know, bottom line again is if you're the CEO of a television network and you say, hey, we're not going to do this stuff because it's wrong, even though it's popular, you're going to get sacked. Mm -hmm. You're going to get sacked and someone else is going to be put in your place, right? Because that's the bias of the medium. Mm -hmm. So, just of interest, I mean, there was there was a few people who did tackle television as a medium, sort of in the sixties and seventies. There was Frank Zappa and people gravitating around there, and Marshall McLuhan, of course. But it, you know, we still don't really talk about TV as a medium. It's fully accepted now. But people are, I think, beginning to talk about smartphones. And I mean, if if TV keeps us in the present, do you think smartphone as a, smartphones as a medium do anything differently? I think it has that same bias. I think electronic media, unless it's it's a storage medium like a disc, um, but generally electronic media are present tense. They speak in the present tense. As I'm talking to you right now, I'm glancing over because my phone buzzes, you mm. know, periodically. You know, and I see, okay, I have an alert about a new email or some other kind of alert. Now, the email may be in the past, but but it's alerting me in the present tense. Something's happening now, now, now. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and that that's the feel that comes from all of these electronic devices. You know, they keep us because, they, and it, and it goes back to a Postman called television attention centered, and that's what all of these. Um, media are. I mean, later on, others talked about the uh, kind of attention-centered economy um, because that's how people make money is by gathering your, getting your attention. And, but that is what the medium itself is all about. I and mean, it, it is, its success is based on its ability to get your attention and then keep your attention. But we're becoming sort of self-aware of this. Do you think that's actually going to change anything, or are we just still going to be sort of staring at our phone, but basically acknowledging, yeah, what I'm doing is really bad for me? 
it has the potential. I mean, there are two levels that we need to always be aware of, and one is the individual level. So, sure, you know, I mean, that's and that's what we try to do. We try to make people more aware, and so you can be convinced, and maybe you'll turn your alerts off. I probably should. Uh, I know better, but I still I don't. Um, some people may even say I am. You know, there are many people who have signed signed off of Facebook for this reason. You know, maybe you'll say I, I don't want to have a smartphone anymore. But and it's but it's funny how things that we never had before suddenly become essential. So, and people used to drive around. You know, here in in New York, people would drive around and not worry about it. And now I'm, you know, it's like, well, what if my car breaks down? Where how do I get help? Mm -hmm. uh, what do I do? And, and maybe in the old days, there were phone booths you could go to. <laughs> there aren't anymore, right? The phone booths are gone. So, I mean, it, the environment itself changes, adjusts, you know, in regard to these media. But, um, you know, or really, and I think very legitimately, you know, I, I mean, we went through 9-11 here, you know, what if, right after that, it's like, what if there's another attack? I mean, I, I, we need to keep, we used to ask students to turn off their cell phones in class, but now, you know, after that, we stopped because, you know, maybe we need to know that there's something going on. Um, you know, so it's very hard to break free of this, but again, individuals can learn to be more mindful, to turn things off, there's a movement um, about taking a technology Sabbath, you know, just taking a day off from the screens and devices. And, you know, it's especially uh, worthwhile for people with families, you know, to just connect with each other, get out into nature and, and reconnect that way. I mean, all of that is great. But at the same time, uh, and it's certainly doable on the individual level, but on a larger macro level and i don't have to have a smartphone but i can't live in a world without them i don't have to ever ride on an airplane but i don't live in a world where they aren't still flying overhead and i'll never set off a nuclear device i can guarantee you that i can't live in a world where they don't exist and where that potential isn't hanging over our heads. So there are some things that can only be addressed collectively. And that is so much harder for us to do. It's such a, so much of a greater challenge that it's hard to imagine how we get out of this. And this is where the most likely scenario given our past history is not that we will say no to anything, but that we'll just develop more technology. And so we'll develop other kinds of devices that will respond to our alerts for us. And we'll, we'll, we'll put in the artificial intelligence kind of programs to alleviate us of some of the pressure that all of these things create. But in doing so, we further distance ourselves from, from our own agency and from our own ability to take control of what's going on in our own, own human freedom. So it's very hard to know where we're going, except, <clears throat> you know, the, the sort of Isaac Asimov foundation uh, series kind of speaks to it. The kind of going back to the medieval sense of islands of sanity, when the world falls into darkness, you know, that that is the fallback position. Mm -hmm. Do you think Postman would be at all surprised by the world we're in today? Oh, I think that he would be, on the one hand, delighted simply by the fact that everything he was saying came <laughs> true. Because, say, back in the 80s, there were, you know, some of the doctoral students were really big on com personal computers and saying, it's nothing like television. It's much more like books and print. You know, computers are text-based. Everything, all the communication is, is in text, not in images. And Postman was going, it's, you know, didn't buy it. He didn't believe it, you know, and, you know, in the 90s, it's like, oh, the Internet is letting people connect and build communities, build virtual communities, you know, and Postman would say, 
a real community is when people are face to face and they don't all they don't all think the same way and have the same interests and have the same needs. They're very different and they have to find a way to get along with one another and negotiate those differences. That's a real community. And they can't just pick up and leave like nothing ever happened. Um, they are stuck there, at least for the time being. So you can call it a virtual community, but maybe we need another word for it because it's not a community as anyone has ever understood it before. And so, I, I mean, I think in all of these things, you know, and including you know, the fact that, you know, he wrote Amusing Ourselves to Death when Ronald Reagan was president. And, uh, you know, the fact that we had an actor as president was shocking to many people when it first happened. Um, now that we had somebody even more, sh uh, even more shallow kind of media personality become president would, would simply speak to everything that he was saying. But of course, he'd be horrified <laughs> as well by everything that's going on. He kind of liked the idea of saying, um, well, on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I'm a pessimist. And on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, I'm an optimist. And I forgot which way Sunday went, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, but, it, you know, and that is that feeling, you know, that, that we can see both the good and the bad. And it's never quite one way or another. We're always struggling with it. Um, but he wouldn't have given up hope either. Because, you know, I mean, he didn't write a book like amusing ourselves to death because he wanted to say it's all over. We're doomed. You know, he, he wrote it because he wanted people to wake up and, and understand what was happening, which is why um, some of the people who um, said were, were most enamored of that book were journalists like Tom Brokaw, you know, for example, who was the longtime anchor of NBC news, you know, even though he seemed to be criticizing exactly what they were doing, you know, he, they, they turned around and said, this is a, this critique is right on the money and we need to rethink what we're doing. Uh, and now we have uh, folks like John Oliver taking the phrase that Postman mocked and now this and turning it into a segment on, on his show. And I think, you know, Postman would look at, you know, The Daily Show and John Oliver's show and Samantha B and all of those as ways in which entertainment are being used to bring to light the excesses of politicians and, and, uh, and, and journalists and how they are. They have given way to to amusement. So there's some ways that you could talk about a, almost a sort of judo-like approach to using amusement against itself through through the sort of parody. Mm. Okay, okay. Um, is there, is there anything about amusing ourselves to death that you you feel we've missed, which is which is key? Hmm. Well, it, it just seems like there's so much about it that that's hard to to say. Uh, but I think we, we've hit on the really main points. I think, you know, I would say education, again, was Postman's great passion. And, and he had a lot to say about the idea of educational t television being an oxymoron. And mm -hmm. he had a great experience as a younger professor, uh, going on. It was called Sunrise Semester. It was college courses being delivered on television in the early morning hours. Uh, and, uh, and he would explain that. What did people write in to him? Because there was no internet or email, so they would write letters. And, you know, what would they write about when he's talking about, say, media ecology and, you know, these, these important ideas about symbols and communication and technology and they would say you need a haircut or um you know that's a nice tie you were wearing today or or would make a comment about how he's speaking and fast forward today and you know, look at what is it that we see in twitter on youtube these kind of comments and the, the just the inane uh quality of discourse of public discourse that exists today 
Um, and uh, that is where education comes down to two people or a group of people talking to each other, co-present in the same space, talking to one another and learning together. And I think if anything, you would say that is the way out, you know, that we read books and then we get together and talk about them. That is our hope for the future. Mm -hmm. So the COVID-19 virtual teaching was a bit of a nightmare in the postman sense. Well, what he would say is that if it had to be, it had to be. We understand that, but anyone who, who wants to go and celebrate the fact that we're now all Zoom meisters and want to sit, wants to say how wonderful this is, let alone you know, some of the folks who say this is even better than being together, um, no, no. We should know that it is a nightmare. Um, and that it is sad. It's a tragedy. It is a tragedy that students from the youngest to the oldest, that students have not, have had to miss out on this experience, have not been able to get together with each other and with their teachers as human beings, talking with one another in the same space. That's sad. And let's not forget that it's sad. We may not be able to do it because of necessity, but let's never forget that it is a loss, not a gain. Mm -hmm. okay. um, whereabouts can we find your work? Online. <laughs> <laughs> you can go to Amazon. I, uh, you know, I have a number of books, and I would say again, I mean, especially if you're interested in Neil Postman, my book, Amazing Ourselves to Death, Neil Postman's Brave New World Revisited, um, provides both an update on the ideas in his book and uh, also provides some of the context, a bit of uh, his life story and uh, the in, um, influences on, on his work. Um, and uh, I have a book on the larger subject of media ecology, um, the subtitle and approach to understanding the human condition. And uh, that really carries on the work of Postman and his colleagues, including uh, Christine Nystrom, who was a very significant colleague and of Neil Postman, and the work of Marshall McLuhan and, and others in this field. And I've try to present a synthesis of these ideas um, so we can move that field forward, but and also an accessible introduction to that kind of thinking. Okay, I'll be sure to put those uh, links in the description below. Um, but Lance Strait, it was a great conversation. Thanks very much for coming on. Well, thank you.